Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. In the past few days, there have been reports of new variants of the COVID-19 virus in South Africa and the United Kingdom. Viruses mutate over time. That's natural and expected. The UK has reported that this new variant transmits more easily, but there is no evidence so far that it's more likely to cause severe disease or mortality. WHO is working with scientists to understand how these generic changes affect how the virus behaves. The bottom line is that we need to suppress transmission of all SARS-CoV-2 viruses as quickly as we can. The more we allow it to spread, the more opportunity it has to change. I cannot stress enough to all governments and all people how important it is to take the necessary precautions to limit transmission. This year has been difficult for all of us, but for health workers, it has never been harder. At this festive time of year, for so many, the best gift for health workers is for leaders and citizens to take precautions that ease the pressure on health systems. Safe and effective vaccines give us hope, but they're not an excuse for people to let down their guard and put themselves and their loved ones at risk. Now is the time to double down on the public health basics that have seen many countries suppress the virus effectively. There are a number of groups that continue to push a narrative that this virus only affects the old and that with vaccines on the horizon, we can relax. COVID-19 affects children and adults in a variety of ways, and it can attack every system in the body. And a growing number of people suffer with long-term consequences of the virus. This includes neurological complications for children and adults, which are still being researched. Vaccines are offering hope for some, but I'm deeply concerned that vaccine nationalism will deprive the world's poorest and most vulnerable people of these life-saving tools. Now is the time for political commitment to be translated into action. Pledges and promises will not protect anyone unless they are realized. Last week, we announced that the COVAX facility, which is backed by 190 countries and economies, has secured access to nearly 2 billion doses of promising vaccine candidates. In the early 2021, 4.6 billion US dollars in additional funding will be needed to purchase COVID-19 vaccines for at least 20% of the population of all low and lower middle income countries. This will ensure health workers and those at highest risk of severe disease are vaccinated, which is the fastest way to stabilize health systems and economies and stimulate a truly global recovery. The 100-100 initiative of WHO, UNICEF, and the World Bank aims to support 100 countries to conduct rapid readiness assessments and develop country-specific plans within 100 days for vaccines and other COVID-19 tools. 89 countries have already completed the assessments, and our teams are working around the clock to ensure that governments and health systems are ready for global vaccine rollout. WHO has also released a new training course for health workers on COVID-19 vaccination, which is available at openwho.org. Vaccines will help to end the pandemic, but the effects of COVID-19 will continue to be felt for many years to come. The pandemic has exploited and exacerbated the vulnerabilities and inequalities of our world, but it has also shown that in the face of an unprecedented crisis, we can come together in new ways to confront it. Every crisis is an opportunity to question the way we do things 
and to find new ways of doing them. For 30 years, our colleagues at the United Nations Development Program, or UNDP, have published the Human Development Report, an annual snapshot of the state of global development. UNDP has long been a critical partner of, to WHO, working closely on a host of health and development issues together to solve problems on the ground so that people get the services they need. The latest edition of the Human Development Report, published last week, takes an in-depth look at the COVID-19 pandemic and what it might mean for the future of development and humanity. To talk more about the report, I'm pleased to be joined by my brother, Akim Steiner, the administrator of UNDP. Akim, thank you for your partnership and thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, dear Tedros. Um, thank you to uh, the very kind invitation to join you for today's briefing. Another very sobering and dramatic point in this uh, pandemic. And uh, it is an honor to be part of this press conference today to mark the launch of what you just referred to, the 2020 Human Development Report. These unprecedented times require us to come together to seek solutions to our shared problems and that includes us as UN agencies. COVID-19 is a dramatic health crisis, and we are just being reminded of it again in the words that you have uh, shared with us. But we also come together today because it has triggered a social and economic, a development crisis that we have not seen in our lifetimes. Not only has the virus taken the lives of more than 1.6 million people, it has destroyed livelihoods, crippled health systems, locked hundreds of millions of children out of classrooms and is costing the world's economy more than $9 trillion over two years, according to the IMF, and the equivalent of up to 400 million jobs, according to our sister agency, the ILO. UNDP projects that for the first time in 30 years, global human development progress is going backwards. UNDP has calculated that by the end of the decade, one billion people could be living in extreme poverty. A quarter of those, 250 million, could be people pushed into poverty as a consequence of the pandemic. As the Human Development Report makes clear, COVID-19 is the latest in a string of consequences resulting from the ever-growing pressures we put on the planet in the name of progress. This is the reality of the Anthropocene, the age of humans, as we refer to it, and in it, humanity is in a certain way, waging a war against itself. For 30 years, UNDP has released the Human Development Index, ranking countries in the world by how they expand people's freedom and opportunities by measuring health, education, and income. But this year, we decided that we needed to try something new and long overdue. We included an experimental index to gauge human progress by accounting for per capita national carbon dioxide emissions and per capita material footprint. The result shows that no country is successful in advancing humanity without extracting a heavy toll on nature and our planet. Yes, there are countries successful in a lighter planetary imprint, and yes, there are countries with prosperous populations, but not one nation is doing both. Achieving this balance is the next frontier of human development, as the report is called. And as it sets out, very critically also, inequality is central and is a barrier to that mission. Because inequality is both a cause and a consequence of planetary imbalances, and it stands in the way of solutions. While the pandemic has undoubtedly touched us all, its impact is being felt differently depending on who you are, where you live, and how much money or power you have. Existing and growing inequalities have meant that around the world, those that already have the least have been hurt the most. And in its simplest, we have all realized that it is extremely expensive to be poor in a pandemic, whether you are a household or a country. Poor people, women, marginalized people, day laborers, and those in unstable employment or in the informal sector have all faced disproportionate hardship. 
For instance, evidence from a number of countries also indicates that the pandemic is erasing decades of progress in women's labor force participation. But the report is very much focused on also stating that it doesn't have to be this way. The first test of our willingness to transform will be the delivery, as Dr. Tedros just referred to, of COVID-19 vaccines to the world's population. The COVID-19 pandemic is exposing and exacerbating fragmentation and long-standing gaps in public health and deepening chronic inequities. The delivery of the COVID-19 vaccine must be equitable, otherwise we risk entrenching the very inequalities which are harming the health of people and the health of planet and are going to give rise to more social and economic tensions. Without delivery of COVID vaccines that are equitable, efficient and trusted, we will undermine the recovery from COVID-19 and not only lose even more lives, we have to be reminded that none of us is safe unless we are all safe. The scientists who have brought us effective COVID-19 vaccine candidates in record time have shown what is possible through collaboration and innovation. We must now be equally bold in taking the baton to deliver the vaccine to the people of all high, middle and low income and least developing countries. This is the ultimate stress for planetary health. Delivering the largest public health intervention of a lifetime and driving in a concurrent way, the recovery in an inclusive and green direction. An undertaking of this magnitude and I envy this requires us all to work together in unprecedented ways. UNDP is privileged and continues to be committed to playing its part in the whole UN family system response, but guided in particular also by WHO's leadership while working in partnership with our sister agencies, Gavi, the Global Fund, and others through the ACT Accelerator, the SDG3 Global Action Plan, and beyond. Thank you so much, Tedros, for inviting me to join you today, because together with the world's people, we can defeat this virus, and most importantly, come out of this deep, dark valley that the world finds itself in right now. And part of that story will be a different development pathway into the future, and that's what the Human Development Report 2020 has tried to address itself to. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Akim. And I hope you will stay with us to respond to questions from journalists who have joined today. And Tariq, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tadros, and thank you, Mr. Steiner, for uh, these uh, very important uh, um, declarations you have made. Uh, we will now open the floor uh, to, um, to questions from journalists who are with us online. Uh, we have an, a big number of questions today, so let's try to be uh, short with uh, one question per person in the language that you prefer the most. So let's start with uh, uh, Shoko Koyama from uh, uh, Japanese NHK. Shoko? Hello, Terry. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Oh, okay, thank you so much for taking my question. So regarding the mutation of the virus, which uh, Dr. Tetris just mentioned, can you please elaborate what WHO knows so far, um, in which countries, apart from UK, um, does the same variant has been identified? And also, if there is a link between this variant and the variant identified in the South Africa? Thank you. So thank you, Naoko, for the, for the question. Um, it's a very timely one today. Um, yes, so there has been a, a variant under investigation, as the UK is calling it, um, that has been reported from, from the UK. Um, this variant um, is SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it has a number of mutations um, that was identified through genomic sequencing that is carried out across the country. Um, the variant uh, under investigation was reported to WHO on the 14th of December, um, following detailed analyses that the UK had done um, in the southeast of England, looking at their epidemiologic surveillance data and their laboratory data, noting an increase in transmission at the end of November, December, um, at, while uh, interventions were in place. Um, they did some phylogenetic analyses and they identified this variant. Uh, they're calling it the B117 lineage, which includes this uh, mutation at the N501Y site. 
Um, there's a lot of work that's ongoing in the United Kingdom, and we're very grateful for working uh, across Public Health England, different academic institutions and modeling groups, different labs that are looking at three different things. They're looking at transmission uh, in this variant, and if there's any differences in this virus's ability to transmit. They're looking at the disease that this variant causes and in terms of clinical presentation and severity, and they're looking at the body's antibody response uh, following infection with this variant. Um, what we understand so far from the data that's been reported by the UK is that they have reported an, an increase in transmission in this variant, uh, but I want to put that into context because what they have told us is that they're looking at an increase in the reproduction number, which is the number uh, of people that one infected individual transmits to another, of an increase of about 0.4. So it's an increase of moving from 1.1 to 1.5. Um, so there is an increase in transmission that they're, that they're looking at. Now they're trying to determine um, how much of that is associated with the variant itself, as well as behavioral differences uh, in individual that this variant has infected. So they're still working through that right now. Um, in terms of disease, in terms of severity, um, the information that we have so far is that there isn't a change in the clinical presentation or severity from this variant. Um, but again, the work is still underway that they're looking at uh, a number of factors, including patients who are hospitalized with this variant as opposed to the wild type, the other uh, viruses circulating. And the studies around the antibody response are currently underway. As we speak here today, um, the scientists in the lab are working on these types of studies and looking at the antibody response, and we expect results from those studies in the coming days and coming weeks. Um, so we're really grateful for colleagues working with us directly. They have informed us with more detailed analysis through our virus evolution working group, uh, which was established to specifically look at mutations and specifically look at what are the studies that are needed to understand what these mutations mean and any potential implications. Um, and they have informed us through our modeling network um, where they've looked at uh, trends in, in surveillance activities and, and surveillance uh, data. So um, the data is, is coming in uh, in real time, and the UK is making information available as quickly as possible. They're reporting it to, to us as well, and we will make uh, updated information uh, available as quickly as possible. Uh, the UK has informed us that they don't believe that there's an impact on the vaccine, so that's good news. Um, but again, there's a lot of information coming out, and there's a lot of studies that are ongoing. Our point, uh, your, your second point about the, uh, South Africa. So at the same time, um, there was another variant that was identified in South Africa, um, and it, it has one of the same mutations, this 501Y mutation, but it's a different variant. They've arisen at the same time, so it sounds like they're linked, but it's actually a separate variant. And South Africans um, have, are also working with us through our virus evolution working group, and they are presenting, uh, they have presented to us some preliminary results um, from the studies that they are doing. They are currently growing the virus uh, in, in South Africa so that more studies can be done, similar to the studies that I just mentioned about uh, the UK. So it does sound confusing that they're the same virus, but these are actual dif different variants. Um, I do want to say a big thank you to to all over the world for people who are doing full genome sequencing and making these sequences available uh, to other researchers and scientists and on publicly accessible platforms like GISAID. This really helps us to monitor these changes, these natural changes that happen in the virus. So we, we need that to continue. We are hopeful that more sequencing capacity can, can increase across the globe, and it has significantly increased during this pandemic, but we still need more. So thank you to all of you who are out there who are doing those sequences and sharing those through publicly available sites. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kierkov. Uh, I think uh, many of journalists who are online uh, wanted to ask questions about precisely about this. Uh, um, Dr. Ryan maybe would like to add something. Uh, Dr. Ryan, please. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me, Ty? Very well, please. Okay. Uh, no, I think uh, Maria says it all, but I think it's important maybe just to re-emphasize uh, uh, a couple of things. Uh, there's zero evidence at this point that there's any increase in, in severity associated with this uh, disease. Clearly, work is ongoing to look at uh, transmission 
um, and, and the increased rates of transmission and how much of that is attributable to this uh, particular variant. We've seen many variants emerge uh, over the last number of months, and some have been successful, some have not been as successful as establishing them as establishing themselves as part of the, the, the driving force of, of, of COVID. What no uh, variant has done yet is establish itself as having any higher level of sever severity or evading our diagnostics or hiding from vaccines or the effectiveness of vaccines. And uh, it remains to be seen with any new variant. And that's why it's so important that we continue the work. We're very grateful to the countries for their transparency, for their scientific openness and cooperation. We need to continue to do this, but it's very important. Countries are now acting on a precautionary principle. They're taking the highest amount of precaution uh, and therefore many countries have put in place some precautionary travel restrictions while they look at the risk assessment around uh, <clears throat> this virus. That is prudent, but it's also important that everyone recognize that uh, this happens, these variants occur, uh, science and health authorities and governments are looking at that very carefully. They're taking care of citizens by being extremely cautious about any new variants and examining the potential impacts. But at this stage, we don't have evidence that this virus will change the severity, the diagnostics or the, the value of vaccines going forward. So uh, I think uh, as we enter the holiday period, as the DG said, we need to stop all SARS-CoV variants. We need to stop all SARS-CoV transmission. We know how to do this. We know how to suppress transmission. We know how to protect ourselves and how to protect others. It's the same rules with this virus, any variant of this virus. And we must focus on what we can do and what we do know rather than what we don't know. Science will find the answers for what we don't know. Governments will take the appropriate precautions. In the meantime, what people, individuals and communities need to get out with the business of stopping the transmission of this virus. Thank you. Many thanks, um, Dr. Ryan. I think it was very important to, to answer these questions uh, uh, because many journalists probably would like to hear more about this. So let's see if uh, we have follow-up on this or some other uh, issues. Uh, let's go to Azerbaijan to our friend Kamran. Uh, Kamran, uh, the floor is yours. Do you hear me? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Hello. Uh, and exactly uh, when we yesterday get information about new mutation of coronavirus, and, and we, we want to know about the situation for South Caucasus region, for Azerbaijan. Is this danger for, um, how many danger for our people, Caucasus region and for Azerbaijan? Because at this time, we, are, uh, we have four-digit number inf infected every day, and it's very bad uh, situation for our health system. And what will do new uh, version of this virus for the uh, South Caucasus region, and exactly special to Azerbaijan? Thank you for your attention. So thank you for the question. I'll, I'll begin and maybe others want to come in, but I think it's, it's worth noting that, you know, we're still learning about this variant identified in the UK, as well as any changes that are happening in the virus. The SARS-CoV-2 virus in any form is a dangerous virus. And the activities that we, that we take ourselves to minimize our own exposure are applicable for any SARS-CoV-2 virus that is circulating, including the new variant that has been identified in the UK. Um, the measures that are in place, uh, the public health measures that are necessary to bring transmission under control include the comprehensive approach that you've heard us talking about. And it's worth emphasizing this again, that we have to, as the D Director General has said repeatedly, we, we need to double down because we have these tools at hand. And this includes the public health measures about active case finding, knowing where the virus is, so that we have strategic testing in our, in our countries, so that we know where the virus is and who is infected and who is not. Making sure that test results come back quick so that we know what public health actions need to take place in terms of making sure we have good clinical care, we have contact tracing cluster investigations, we have supported quarantine of contacts, and then all of us need to make sure that we do everything that we can to minimize our exposure. We have the holidays coming up across many, many countries, across many different religions. We need to make sure that we as individuals do what we can to minimize our exposure. We say, know your risk, 
lower your risk. And there are things that you can do at an individual level. And this is physical distancing, this is wearing a mask, this is washing your hands, making sure that when you do wear a mask, you have clean hands, you put your mask on appropriately, you take the mask off appropriately, you wash your hands, you practice respiratory etiquette, you avoid crowded spaces, you keep your distance, you make sure that if there, you try to avoid enclosed crowded spaces, especially with poor ventilation, open a window if you're in, indoors. So there's lots of individual level measures that you can take. Um, and as, as individuals, as communities, we can all help each other out. You know, make sure that while we are physically separated, that we remain socially connected. Um, as we come up to the end of 2020, um, it's a difficult period for many people, whether we have a pandemic or not, it's really important that we reach out and we help each other and we touch base with each other um, and just make a phone call. Um, so everything that we can do now for this variant, as well as the SARS-CoV-2 viruses that are circulating, um, still remain true. We need to do everything we can to prevent as many infections as we can because this is a dangerous virus. Not only for older individuals, as the DG also said today, it's for everyone. We are learning about the long-term effects of long COVID for individuals. There's so much that we're still learning about this particular virus. So do what you can to keep yourself safe. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Van Kierkorp. Um, uh, let's go to, uh, I would assume it's, uh, it's Mexico. Claudia Luna Palencia uh, from Vertigo Politico and TV Azteca. Claudia, if you can hear us, please unmute yourself. Do, you, do we have Claudia online? If not, uh, let's go to Imogen from BBC. Imogen? Imogen, if you hear us, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Um, permission comes up a bit late. Hello. Um, I, I know you've, you've said a bit about this new variant. Um, I'm just wondering if you're able to give any more precise detail. We've heard a lot about how this is up to 70% more infectious than other strains, the, the strains that are already circulating. Can you um, give us any detail about what evidence you've seen that suggests that and what countries should do about it, apart from what you've already said, the usual stuff we know works, wash hands and distance? Thanks, Imogen. I, I, I will begin, and maybe others want to come in, but I am going to repeat what I just said uh, because I think it's worth worth hammering in. Um, in terms of the reports from the UK about an up to 70% increase, um, that information comes from different types of analyses that UK colleagues are working on. Um, they've looked at their surveillance data um, across the country, um, looking at uh, data that's coming in from testing at different sites um, in Southeast England, but also across the country, across all of the UK. Um, they're also looking at um, phylogenetic analysis, looking at the sequences um, and doing detailed analysis of making estimates of the reproduction number, of the generation time, et cetera, to look at differences with this uh, circulating virus and other wild type viruses. So they look at people who are sequenced and so not all people across the UK are sequenced, so it's a subset of the population. But having said that, the 70% increase is an increase of a reproduction number of about 0 0.4. So it's an increase from 1.1 uh, reproduction number um, to 1.5. Now this is in the presence of interventions that are uh, in place across the UK. So what they're doing now is they're doing more analysis of this as more surveillance data and more sequence data comes in. They're always refining uh, these estimates, so these estimates may slightly change, and that's to be expected. Um, but what they're trying to also do is look at what is associated with this variant and what is associated with people's behavior in terms of the interventions and applying and, and complying with the interventions that are in place. Could be the variant, a combination of the behavioral factors or, and both. Um, and so that's what they're looking at right now. We expect more analysis and results from our colleagues in the UK over the coming days, um, coming weeks, as they continue to look at this. They're also doing some epidemiologic investigations of individuals with this variant compared to those without this variant. 
They're doing detailed studies of patients in hospitals to look at the, the clinical course and, and severity, but again, we have no indication that there's a change in uh, disease presentation or mortality, so that's good news. And then there's the more studies of the neutralization. But again, I come back to what do we need to do? We need to do it all. Um, the combination of factors is what works. Um, with a reproduction number of 1.5, that means that one individual can infect more than one person. That means an epidemic will grow. But it means that we just need to work hard at making sure we don't give this virus an opportunity to do so. So especially as we see the, the upcoming holidays and many people wanting to spend time together, we need to think about how do we minimize our exposure, we minimize the opportunity for us to pass the virus to other ones. We want everyone to have a safe holiday uh, this year. It may not be exactly how we anticipated spending it, um, but it doesn't mean that we can't celebrate it in our own way. Um, but it's do it all. Um, and it's the individual level measures, it's complying with national guidance, it's being patient as the vaccines and vaccination come online. We just really need to hang in tight. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Dr. Mike Ryan. Uh, uh, thanks, Imogen. And <clears throat> thank you, uh, Maria. I think, as Maria said, the, with, with the work being done by the UK, and it's very responsible work, just looking at what is the combination <clears throat> potentially of the virus and also just the, the, the difficulty of the measures uh, at this time of year in, in any given country, what's driving transmission, uh, and they will sort that out. But if we even look at their estimates uh, with the new estimate of around 1.5, that just put the bar up a little bit. It, in, in some senses, it means we have to work harder even if the virus has become a little bit more efficient in spreading, the virus can be stopped. The R0 is around 1.5. That means the virus can be stopped. And we've had R0 is much higher than 1.5 at different points in this pandemic, and we have got it under control. So this situation is not, in that sense, out of control, but it cannot be left uh, to its own devices either personal behavior or the virus itself. As, the, as we learn more about the virus, we learn more about uh, how, uh, how, how it may replace other strains. And that, as I said, has happened before. But we're not talking about a reproductive number like measles, which is somewhere between 12 and 18, or uh, mumps or chickenpox, 10 to 12. We're talking about 1.5. The virus may have become slightly more efficient in transmission. That can have a big impact on numbers when we have so many people being infected. But it means the virus can be uh, contained, the virus can be suppressed, um, and it's, it is exactly the same interventions, exactly the same behaviours done with more intensity and more completeness that we need to focus on right now. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. Uh, we see there is a huge interest in this particular issue, and uh, it is important to answer. Let's uh, see... Uh, what the next question will be, and it's uh, Christian Ulrich from uh, German news agency DPA. Uh, Christian. Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, can you explain, Maria, maybe, or uh, Mike, can you explain what more transmissible means in layman's terms? Does that mean the virus uh, flies over more than 1.5 meters or does it mean that uh, there's more virus in a person so the person next standing next to to that person is infected in five minutes rather than 10 minutes before just try and make it um, more you know more understandable for layman's people who wonder what is different mm -hmm. now than from what was different what what was happening three weeks ago and the, there was also a question that hasn't been answered how many countries have actually reported cases of this new variant so far thank you so thank you for thank you for this question it's a great question and i actually really very much appreciate the way that you ask it because we sometimes forget how complicated a lot of this is and we use a lot of terms that may just not um, translate very well to everybody. Um, and so what we mean when it transmits more, so the data that we have from the UK, and I'm reporting what they are telling us through the detailed modeling analysis, is that when you have somebody that is infected, what we estimate is how many people do, if I were infected, how many people would I infect to someone else? Um, if I can infect more than one person, 
and then that person infects more than one person, an epidemic can grow. So what we, we call that the reproduction number. In the beginning of an outbreak, um, everyone is susceptible. And so there aren't interventions in place yet. They're, they're starting to come online. And so we look at that first reproduction number. Um, right now, we have a lot of interventions in place uh, across the world. And that same number of how many people do I infect one person to another person, what does that number look like with those interventions in place? Ideally, you want that number to be below one because then the virus, then the outbreak will die out. In the situation in the UK, the reproduction number, this number, has increased from 1.1, meaning if I were infected, I would infect 1.1 person or just over one person. Um, and that's important because it means it grows. It'll grow, it'll grow at, at, a, at a certain rate. If I infect 1.5 people, I know that doesn't make sense because it's not, you can only infect a full person, but it means I can infect more people. Um, and so that is a concern when the reproduction number increases. What we want to see happen is when you have intervention in place, it reduces. Now, how it transmits, we don't have any indication that it's changed how it spreads, meaning like it, it, it's a respiratory pathogen. So it spreads between me and you through these particles in the air. Some are big, called droplets. Some are small, called aerosols. But mainly what is happening is that the virus spreads between people who are in close contact with another. That's still the same. Um, there are detailed epi investigations that are underway, and we will let you know if anything in that space changes, but the virus likes people who are in close contact with one another. So when we say there are things that you need to do with your physical distancing, you're wearing a mask, you're washing your hands, all of that remains true in terms of protecting yourself and protecting the ability of you to spread from somebody else. So I hope that was a little bit um, more clear, but maybe others want to come in. I'm sure Mike will, will want to come in on that. In terms of the international spread, um, so we are, are learning um, of countries that are doing sequencing, that are looking for individuals with this particular variant. Um, and there are a few countries that have reported single cases of, these, uh, of this variant. Um, and and we're, they're reported, the sequences are being uploaded into GISAID and other online platforms. So again, we're grateful for that. Um, and we understand and it's Australia had one case, uh, Iceland, Italy, the Netherlands, and Denmark. Um, each with single cases with the exception of Denmark, and I think the cases are around 10. I may be wrong on that, so I don't have the latest updated information. But countries are, are, are looking. Um, and so that's the current information that we have um, at the moment. Dr. Ryan. Yeah, um, I think Maria explains it very well. And in the end, uh, uh, when viruses change the genetic sequences, in effect, they're, they're, they're just changing a sequence of instructions that are used to build proteins. It's like a program. Uh, and many, many of you will know programs are a set of instructions that I like, and that sometimes most of you women out there will know that uh, if you gave the same set of uh, flatback instructions for furniture to men, you'll end up with uh, many versions of slightly different furniture at the end based on their interpretation of those instructions. And I think it's pretty much the same in this case. The instructions can change slightly and the outcome can change slightly. That's very important because if the proteins change because of the slight changes in instruction, the shape of the protein can change. And the spike protein on the virus, on the SARS-CoV-2 virus is very variable because of that. And therefore it can either fit very well into the receptors on human cells or not so well. And it's a pure chance thing. Some mutations result in that uh, protein being able to bind a little better. Some result in it not being able to, able to bind so well. If it binds a little better, a little bit more successfully, a little bit more tightly, then the virus finds it easier to get into the cell. It's easier to infect the cell and the person can be infected more, more easily. So that can change either the ease with which the person can be infected or the viral loads that they may have ultimately uh, with the same exposure. So in that sense, it is very much linked to those instructions, the success of the virus in the human body. And then as Maria said, the types of transmission don't necessarily change, but the, if you increase the number of people who are infected in the community, then obviously the rate of infection can then increase when more people are successfully infected with the virus. But again, we're talking hypothetically here, we've seen an estimate of a small increase in, in the reproductive number from the UK. It remains to be seen how much of that is due to the to the, the specific genetic change in the new variant. I suspect some, 
Um, and as I said, we're going to have to, Maria has laid it out, we're just going to have to keep working hard, keep doing it all, um, and uh, dealing with this SARS-CoV-2 variant as we have dealt with all the previous ones. Thank you, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Van Kierkegaard for these additional in-depth uh, explanations. Uh, let's see if uh, we have uh, more questions on this, or we may have some other questions. Let's turn to uh, Georgia, and we have uh, Katevan Kardava from uh, TV Georgia. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Uh, European Medicine Agency recommends Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine today. It's a great news and historic uh, day and achievement. Uh, we want to know and would like to know what are the procedures when HWO will recommend a vaccine. Uh, and also I have a question for Dr. Ryan. Uh, how would you uh, assess the situation in Georgia right now, regional director for Europe is in Tbilisi. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I will, uh, I will call on uh, Mariangela Shimao, our Assistant Director General. Uh, Mariangela? Yeah, thank you. I think if, thank you for the question. Can you hear me, Tarek? Uh, yes, uh, very well. Oh, okay. If you can turn off the you. camera as well so we could see you, but we can hear you very well. Yeah, I, I'm on the iPhone, so I don't know how to turn on the camera. But uh, just to say that it's very welcome news that uh, the, the EMA has issued the market authorization for the conditional market authorization for the Pfizer vaccine. WHO is in finalizing the emergency use listing of the same vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine. We received the dossiers and we are working together with the EMA. And it's likely that before the end of this month, we will also have an emergency use listing uh, by WHO for this vaccine. Then we do have uh, the, the WHO's advisory group on immunization is also assessing the recommendations of how this vaccine should be used at country level. So this is uh, some parallel work that's coming, uh, going on as we speak. So we will have the WHO emergency use listing, which allows for a quicker registration of this vaccine in many countries where WHO works with the bilateral agreements. And we also have the, the advisory group working on the policy recommendations for the use of the Pfizer vaccine. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if uh, Dr. Swaminathan would like to add something to this. Yes, maybe very briefly, just to say that uh, we look forward to the SAGE recommendations, which is the policy uh, for how this vaccine should be used and, and, and the details of which groups and uh, uh, the schedule and so on. And that's uh, we're expecting that to happen in the first week of January for, for the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, hopefully, we're going to look at the Moderna dossier as well soon after that. Um, we do hope that through the COVAX facility that we will be able to start rolling out the Pfizer vaccine in a limited set of countries late January, early February to vaccinate healthcare workers in those countries who are at highest risk for um, uh, for getting the infection and also to protect the health system uh, from from being overburdened and collapsing this will allow us to first of all have a public health impact by protecting this high risk group but also to be a learning for us to then rapidly be able to scale out vaccines to the remainder of the um, covax facility countries so we're really looking forward to that and we're doing everything possible uh, to try to roll this out uh, as quickly as possible, hopefully in the, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Swaminathan and Dr. Shimo. Uh, we will move now to Shane from CCTV. Shane. Hi, Tariq. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. So, thank you, Tariq. My question is again about the mutation identified in UK. So, will this mutation make the testing harder 
And will this mutation have any effects on the therapeutics? Besides that, so for the countries, for the pandemic, how will this mutation mean? Uh, what, what does it bring to the whole global pandemic? And uh, what specific suggestions you may offer to countries to deal with this mutation? And one last information I wanted to verify that uh, Dr. Maria Van Kirchhoff said in the beginning of the briefing that the mutation was reported to WHO on December 14th. But we saw some reports that think this mutation was among some mutations that was identified in England in September. So could you confirm that when we found this mutation, or we found this like in September, but we only identified its transmission ability to be higher this month, or so could you verify that? Thank you. So thank you for the question. I'll take the last part of the, the question first. Um, so when, um, as I was explaining in the beginning in the first answer, so the colleagues in the UK are monitoring sequences all, all the time and they, they conduct full genome sequencing of a proportion of the cases across the country. Um, they were alerted to an increase in transmission in Southeast England towards the end of November, uh, early December, around that time. Uh, they could provide the more specific details of their detailed analysis. Um, and in doing so, they, were, they had the question of why are we seeing increased transmission if we have interventions in place. Um, they were looking at the characteristics of the cases and they were looking at the sequences and they identified this variant under investigation, this B117 lineage. When they did back tracing and retrospective analyses of cases in Southeast England, they saw some of those cases where it had this variant in September. So that was looking retrospectively. Um, and so we, when they were doing more detailed analysis, they have phylogenetic analysis, they presented, they, they um, reported to WHO through the IHR mechanism on the 14th of December, where they outlined this variant uh, under investigation. They outlined all of the different mutations that were there on the 14th. Um, and then we followed up with a number of teleconferences with our European office, but also with ECDC and colleagues in the UK to get more details on the analysis that, we're, that they are carrying out, currently still carrying out. Um, and that's where that retrospective identification of those cases uh, in September came from. But the transmissibility, um, those reports came late last week um, in terms of the analysis that were done looking at this increase in, in transmission that they've reported. Um, so I hope that that's clear. There is, um, they are looking at, because some of the mutations are in the spike protein, um, they are looking at the diagnostics that are currently available uh, and that are in use. Um, there, most of the tests that are out um, look at multiple targets within the genome, within the sequencing sequences themselves. Um, and so it will not affect diagnostic tests that have multiple targets. There are some tests, very few tests that are out there that are only look at a single target those tests may be impacted by um, being able to detect this particular variant. But as I said, most of the tests that are out there use multiple gene targets, um, and so that, it, that is good news. But they're still evaluating right now. They're really looking at all of the tests that are, that are in use um, in the UK, and they will be reporting to us on the efficacy of the tests that are there. Um, I don't have any information on the therapeutics, but we haven't, um, that is also being looked at, as I said, they're looking at the hospitalizations, um, but we don't have any indication that the therapeutics would be altered by this. Soon you may have more information on this, but th as I said, the studies are underway and they haven't reported any impact on, on therapeutics for, the, for patients with this variant versus other SARS-CoV-2 viruses. Dr. Ryan. Yes, thanks, Harry. Thanks, Maria. Um, again, I, I think we have to uh, remain very sort of balanced here. This is the, probably the first time where we've been able to use real-time genetic sequence to track the movement of a disease around this planet. And it does mean that we're picking up new variants all the time. Their significance when they're picked up at the moment they're picked up is not known because we, we just find them and then we have to find out what they're doing within populations. We look forward to see what's happening. We look backwards to see if we found, if this has existed before and how many people it's infected. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible detective story, a scientific detective story. And it's what's wonderful is that countries like the UK and countries like South Africa are looking. They're monitoring. They're taking it deadly seriously, and then they're looking for those variants and then seeing in the real world what those variants are doing, whether they're having an impact or not having an impact. So this is an era of new tools. We're getting used to how to use those tools, 
And it's really important as we use those tools that we are very cautious then and, and very, very measured in how we communicate with, 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 with the media and with you, the public, so that we're communicating important information, but at the same time that we're not uh, overplaying that information in a way that uh, scares people too much. We have to find a balance. It's very important to have that transparency. It's very important to tell the public the way it is, but it's also important to get across that this is a normal part of virus evolution and being able to track a virus this closely, this carefully, this scientifically, in real time, is a real positive development for global public health. Um, and those countries doing this kind of surveillance should be commended. But it does bring it with it uh, some moments when we gasp at, at the emergence of new strains, uh, and then we have to track those strains uh, over time. Uh, but uh, the, the, the message overall is a positive message of knowing and learning how this virus moves and works and then finding ways to combat its spread. What's good is the measures we currently have in place are the correct measures. We need to continue to do what we've been doing. We may just have to do it for a little, uh, with a little more intensity and for a little longer to make sure we can bring this virus under control. Many thanks, Dr. Ryan. Uh, we have a time for one or two more questions. Uh, Dr. Shimao mentioned the SAGE meeting beginning of uh, January. We would uh, and we will have a press briefing following that meeting, so uh, stay tuned for outcome of the SAGE meeting. Uh, let's take a question from Pamela Falk from uh, CBS. Pamela? Uh, yes, thank you, Tariq, and thank you, Chris. I, I, my question is for Dr. Von Kerhob and Dr. Ryan or Dr. Tedros. You talk about the research that continues to be done for the B11 variant or the variant in the UK, uh, that, and you have said that uh, there's no evidence that there's a negative impact on the vaccine or you believe there isn't, or the UK believes there isn't. How do you know? Can you explain how you know? Have you tested it on the, uh, have you tested the vaccine on this variant? How do you know that the current vaccines that are available are applicable and will work with the new variant? Thank you so much. I can start there, Maria, if you don't mind, uh, because I think we can, at this point, bring uh, Dr. Sumi in. This is being tested. You, do, you, you don't know, first of all, when you start, um, but it's, it's usually vaccines are aimed at a quite a broad, uh, are able to, to cover quite a broad range of changes in any given virus in terms of the, the protein. But, uh, or, uh, but uh, it, it does need to be checked and it is currently being checked in a number of labs. I think we have Sumi there. I think I saw Bruce there, so certainly have Bruce, but I think we have Sumi online. And I know this is a very high priority for the uh, for the R&D blueprint and for COVAX right now, and the work is underway. Sumia? Thank you, uh, Mike. And uh, as you said, I think this is a very important uh, important issue because a lot of uh, the hope now is on the vaccines making. Uh, first an impact on the acute phase of the pandemic by reducing deaths, by protecting the most high risk and vulnerable groups and by protecting our health systems. And then ultimately really making a, a, an impact on the pandemic itself by creating that population immunity. Now, all viruses mutate, some more rapidly than others. We have one example, the influenza virus, which mutates quite rapidly and requires every year the vaccine strain actually to be uh, to be reviewed and revised based on the circulating influenza strains prevalent that year. So that's one example of a viral vaccine that's that's uh, uh, updated every year with the with the current information. Now the SARS-CoV-2 virus is mutating at a much slower rate than the influenza virus, and and so far, even though we've seen a number of changes, a number of mutations none has made a, a significant impact on either the susceptibility of the virus to any of the currently used uh, therapeutics, drugs, uh, or, the, or the vaccines under development. And one hopes that that will continue to be the case, but this is why we have to continuously monitor what's happening to this virus. This is why the 
sequencing is important and the the research that's why we have all of these expert groups that are looking at uh, what's happening with uh, maria mentioned the virus evolution working group there are now laboratories across the world that have set up the experiments the assays to culture this new variant of the virus and test both convalescent plasma so serum from people who've recovered from natural infection as well as those who've been vaccinated we have serum taken from those individuals and then in the laboratory you can actually see whether this virus is being killed or neutralized by these antibodies from people who've got the vaccine or from people who've recovered from the disease and that will tell us there are also experiments being done uh, the the companies that are running vaccine trials like the Pfizer and Moderna and so on are going to follow up individuals who are in those trials to see if any of them get infected with SARS-CoV-2 and develop disease. And if they do, they're going to sequence that strain to see whether that's a, a variant or it's an escape mutant. Uh, and, and those kind of studies in the coming weeks and months are going to give us uh, a lot of information about how this virus is going to behave, especially when it's put under pressure with more and more people getting vaccinated. Um, and th this is again something that viruses do naturally to escape and to survive. Uh, they mutate uh, so that they can continue to spread. So that's why it's really important, again, going back to what Mike and Maria said, the focus now has to be on bringing transmission down and controlling it and getting it to as low as possible. Because the more viruses you have in circulation, the more chances of mutation and, and the more such variants that can arise. So the, the, the bottom line here is keep the virus transmission low, keep circulation low, don't allow it to get out of control and, and, and spread in the population. We, that way, we'll also keep the mutations down. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Swaminathan. Uh, we have uh, lots of questions in line, but unfortunately, we won't be able to take all of them. So let's uh, try to take one or two max. So uh, Corinne from Bloomberg. Corinne. Hi, thanks for taking my question. It's a very short one. Um, as vaccines are being rolled out across the US, UK, China, and um, soon gonna start across the rest of Europe as well, um, you mentioned um, the WHO's dashboard um, tracking these inoculations. Um, since we're, we're seeing so many vaccinations already, do you have a better idea of when that might go live and what kind of data you'll be co you'll be able to be collecting? <clears throat> I don't know if uh, Dr. Swaminathan can answer that. If not, uh, we are happy to look back for information. Dr. Sumia? Yeah, I could just say that, you know, the WHO does track uh, immunization coverage in countries across the world. We do this in partnership with UNICEF and, uh, and other partners. Um, this is something we do on an annual basis, uh, but this is for childhood vaccinations and we produce a report every year on coverage and on challenges. For the, uh, the new virus vaccine for COVID-19, we actually plan to have a much more real-time dashboard and this is now being set up. Hopefully it's going to be updated on a monthly basis where we'll be able to track coverage uh, across the world in, in, in different countries. Uh, a lot will depend, of course, on the data that's provided to us by countries. We're setting up the systems now and um, and the uh, indicators that are going to go into the dashboard. But yes, that should be up and running sometime early next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Samnatan. We will, of course, uh, keep everyone informed um, about uh, Eric? Uh, new dashboards. Dr. Ryan, please. Uh, just to supplement with Sumi, because the adding in vaccine data is very important. We've been tracking multiple data points uh, on this uh, epidemic uh, since the very beginning. Uh, epidemiologic, uh, point, uh, epidemiologic data, activity data, impact data, a lot of social data, a lot of information that's been on our country platforms uh, and been out there. Countries themselves have built their own uh, dashboards to track this disease. So it's really important that we can now continue in and do uh, the necessary tracking for this virus. As Sumi said, for a lot of routine immunization, 
It's a yearly process, a monthly process, but we do real-time tracking. We have done and do do for yellow fever, for, for meningitis, for cholera and for Ebola. For epidemic diseases, we are in a position to be able to do real-time daily tracking of disease, of uh, vaccines as they're, as they're used at country level. The task here, though, is, is much bigger because usually we're dealing with one, two, three, maybe four or five countries in which we're doing mass campaigns. This is hundreds of countries potentially at the same time. So the, the need to be able to track this carefully uh, is very important, both to look at how the vaccine has been used, to look for side effects, uh, to see how effective the vaccine is in the real world. All of those matters are very, very important. But it, we'll be adding... The, the, the tracking system for vaccination to a, a vast uh, system for tracking all kinds of other interventions that WHO and partners are currently using to support our member states. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ryan. Uh, we will conclude our press briefing uh, with this. I understand uh, our guest uh, administrator, A. Kim Steiner, is still online, so maybe uh, I will give the floor to Dr. Tetris. Yeah. Uh, Akim, if you're uh, online and you would like to say uh, closing words, you're welcome. Thank you, Ted. It was very briefly um, clearly today's focus, given that it is the WHO press conference and everything that is happening uh, in the last uh, 24, 48 hours. Um, I think uh, it's just very good to be here with you. And I just want to add that um, one reminder as you lead us and as the world tries to contain the virus, our ability to do so is also premised on being able to recognize that for hundreds of millions of people to do the right thing is extremely challenging. When less than half the world's population has social protection, when in many developing countries, 70 to 80% of people live in the informal sector, a lockdown and ability to contain the virus is directly relatable to the ability of people to survive this. And this literally means the ability to have food and income. And that is why, as we in the development program of the UN look, for instance, at temporary basic incomes, something that in richer nations through furloughs, unemployment benefits, social safety, and the crisis response is being provided. Let us not forget that for literally um, hundreds of millions of people there is, as of now, nothing. And our ability to fight this virus through technology and science and innovation is equally premised on our ability to be societies in which we do not forget that there are many who rely on others to be able to do what is called on us. In that spirit, um, Dr. Tedros, dear colleagues, um, we join today in looking forward to um, both containing the virus, making the vaccine something that becomes accessible to everyone. In the meantime, we must not forget that people need to survive, not just the virus, but in fact, poverty and the inability to be able to cope with this economic reality. Thank you so much for having me join you today. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kim. Uh, we were hoping that we would have uh, more questions on the report, but uh, uh, because of the developing story of the new strain, I think uh, the questions were focused on that. Uh, but I would like to join my colleague, uh, Mike Ryan, in uh, appreciating South Africa and UK for their strong surveillance. And that's why the new strain was uh, detected. And I would like actually to use this opportunity to remind other countries to strengthen their surveillance. Mutation happens, it's natural. The most important thing is to detect it as early as, as possible. And as Mike said, all the measures we are taking, the tools we, we have, actually work for the new strain too. So the most important thing is to really uh, be um, implementing all the measures that, that we know uh, globally. And having said that, I uh, would like to thank um, um, the media who joined uh, today, uh, and also on behalf of uh, my colleagues here, on behalf of uh, WHO, we wish all Christians around the world Merry Christmas and uh, Happy New Year. Thank you so much.